sermon is entitled Back to the Bible. Back to the Bible. Let's just have one more word of prayer before we move on. Let us pray. Father of God in heaven again. We're thankful, Lord, to be here. We invite your Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us and guide us. May not be I to be seen, but may you be seen for your word. May you help us to truly get back to the Bible. This is my prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, there's a story about a boy, a young boy, who was playing around the house, playing in the living room one day, and his mom was cooking in the kitchen, and the boy was playing around their living room table, and he saw this big, beautiful book on the table. And he started opening the book, and he started looking through the pages, and he was having a good time. And when his mom came out the kitchen and saw him playing with the book, she got mad. She got angry. She said, boy, put that book down. Don't touch that book. The boy looked at the mom and was surprised. said, mom, well, why? Whose book is this? Why is it so important? She said, boy, don't you know that that's the Bible? That's God's book, son. He looked at the mom and said, mom. Maybe you should give it back to him because nobody reads it over here. <laughs> you see, oftentimes, we have big, beautiful books on our coffee tables just to kind of show that we have a beautiful Bible. Oftentimes, we have Bibles in our beds or in our, in our drawers. Just We keep it there for good luck. You guys know people like that, right? Or they may, we may have, we have Bibles that are just like this one on the screen that's collecting dust, and the Bible is screaming out to us saying what? Read, Read me. That's right. Today, we want to get back to the Bible. Is that all right with you? Notice this quotation from the book Great Controversy, okay? Great Controversy, page 519. Very powerful quote here. It tells us that Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect what? Prayer and the searching of the scriptures, notice this now, will be overcome by his attacks. Let's pause right there real quick. Did you guys hear what this quote said? It says Satan well knows, or he knows, that if he can lead you, make this personal now, if he can lead you to neglect prayer, and we've already talked about how important prayer is, right? If he can lead us to neglect prayer, not only prayer, but the searching of the scriptures, what will happen to us? We will be overcome by his attacks. You may be wondering, why am I being overcome? Are you praying like you should? Are you searching the scriptures like you should? Many of us sometimes wonder, Lord, why am I going through this thing? Why am I going through these trials? Why am I going through these hardships? Why does it feel like I'm being overcome? Well, here Satan knows that if you neglect prayer and searching of the scriptures, you will be overcome by his attacks. Now, does this tell us that he won't attack us, though, if we read and if we pray and if we study the word? No, you know he's going to always try to attack us, right? No matter what we do, he will always constantly try to bombard us and attack us. But if we fail to do these things, we are more susceptible. No, no, it doesn't even say we might be, but we will be overcome by his attacks. Notice what it goes on to say. Therefore, what does he do? He invents every possible device to do what? Engross the mind. Well, I don't have my phone on with me, but is a phone a device? Come on now. Yes. Oh, I got this though. Is an iPad a device? Yes. Right? Television, is that a device? Yes. Radio, is that a device? Yes. Now, there are our telephones, our cell phones, iPads, TV, are those in themselves bad? No. no. But if we allow those devices to engross, what does the word engross mean? Yeah, it, 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 it saturates, it takes over your mind. And Lord, so am I the only one who needs help on this? Come on now, right? That cell phone, right? You got to pray because 
a lot of times when you first wake up, instead of getting down on your knees and seeking the Lord, we're looking on our phones. Am I the only one? I'm just going to be real, all right? It's going to be real today. So here we have to make sure, because Satan well knows. He understands if he can lead us to neglect prayer, if he can lead us to neglect the searching of the scriptures, he will overcome us. We will be overcome by his attack. So we have to be very careful, even the good things that we have and do, that we don't get caught up. In fact, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Notice what the Bible says here. Very famous and popular quote here. The Bible says this. It says to, what's the first word? What is it? Oh, yours says be, that's a different version, right? It says be what? Be diligent, right? In the King James Version, it says, this is what it means to be diligent. Look at what it says on the screen. Study. Okay? Be diligent or to do what? Study. To show yourselves approved unto everyone else around you. Unto who? Unto God, right? It says a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what does the Apostle Paul admonish us to do with God's word? Does he tell us to read God's word? He doesn't tell us to read it. What does he tell us to do? To study. There's a difference between reading and studying. Do you guys agree? I remember going to school, right, and having tests, and there would be big textbooks that would have to study in order for me to understand the things that were going to be on the test. But guess what? I didn't study it. The day before, I would read it. Come on, is anyone else? Anybody else, right? I would read it, try to cram all those things in my mind, but did I retain it? Did it? I may have retained it maybe even for that day, but do you think it stuck with me? No. There's a difference between reading and studying. Reading is simply on the surface level, because you can read something, maybe comprehend it, but it doesn't stick. Studying is something that you do that will stick. Studying takes work. In fact, that's why the Bible says that a workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when we study the Bible, you need to put in some work. I remember one of my friends, he told me that one of the things he used to do was snorkel. Anybody ever snorkel in here? Okay. In Hawaii? Was it in Hawaii? Okay, yeah. Hawaii, they have those places, right, where you, just, you can rent a snorkel. Even if you have a snorkel, right, there's areas where you can put the snorkel, put your head in the water, and you can see the beautiful sea life in that water. But you're limited. Because when you snorkel, that hole, that, what's that called? The snorkel, I guess. But the tube goes up into the air, and you're limited to just there, right? You can see the beauty, but you're very limited. He said he used to snorkel. Then one day his friend invited him to scuba dive. Are you guys feeling me right now? Come on. And he thought that when he snorkeled, he saw a lot of stuff. But when his friend invited him to scuba dive, they went deeper into the water. He was actually able to breathe in the water because of the apparatus, right? And he saw even more animals than he thought that he could imagine. Are you guys feeling that? When we study the Bible, at first, it's okay to enjoy the milk, the sincere milk. It's okay to have a surface reading of the Bible. But the deeper and deeper you get, the more experience you get, you shouldn't be satisfied with just snorkeling. Come on, Brother Pete, right? But you should want to scuba dive into God's Word because when you do that, you'll see a treasure that you've never seen before. That's the difference between simply reading and 
instead. And here it tells us a workman needs to rightly divide the word of truth. What does that tell me? That tells me that there's a wrong way and there's a right way. People will try to twist scripture into thinking, into showing things that are really not true. But guess what? They're twisting it to their own damnation. That's what the Bible says. That's why you have to study yourself approved unto God. Don't put your trust in the preacher. And I'm a preacher and I'm saying don't put your trust in me. But put your trust in God and his word. And the Holy Spirit will teach you and he'll show you how to write me. Now, why should we study this Bible? Why else? Go to Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Look at this text. I love these texts here. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Why else should we study this Bible? Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Notice what the Bible says. Romans 15, verse 4. If you're there, say amen, so I know that you're there. Right? Romans 15, verse 4. Notice what it says. I love this text here. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have what, everyone? Hope. Did you guys hear that? The reason why, one of the reasons why we study the word it's because we can learn, and the things that we study will give us some hope. It gives me hope when I read about Moses, you know, who, first off, he was given away at birth, right? That's already a hard life, right? But then he had to, you know, then he, but then he had a good life. But then he ended up being a murderer, but God still used him to deliver God's people out of the promised land. Doesn't that give you hope today? I mean, I go to jails, you know, uh, in, in, in Elko, I go to the jails and I speak to these people who've done these heinous crimes. They, they've murdered people, they robbed people, they've done a lot of violent crimes. But you know what? Even for those people, they can still have hope. It gives me hope when you see those three young men who were wanting to live their life for God. You know, I'm talking about in the book of Daniel, right? Hananiah and Mishael, as a writer, who wanted to live their life for God, who faced death, and they'd rather be obedient and not sin against God and face death. And they were thrown into the fire, but as they were thrown into the fire, guess what? Those guys who threw them in the fire, they burnt to them. But while they were in the fire, Jesus was there protecting them through that fire, and he delivered them out of that fire. That gives me hope for the future. What about you? That no matter what trials we may go through, no matter what things, no matter what fire we may go through, Jesus will be there with us to carry us. You see, the reason, one of the other reasons why we study the Bible is because when we look at these various Bible characters and what they went through, and we see how God delivered them, no matter what situation you may be going through, we can have that same hope. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, the Bible says, Always be prepared, I'll read it in your hearing, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Are you ready? If someone asks you, well, why, why are you a Christian? Are you ready to give them an answer? Are you ready to give people an answer when they show you, how come you smile when I know that there are a lot of trials going on in your life? Are you ready to give an answer of the hope? You know, as we study the Bible, as we go to church, there's a group of people who the Bible calls very noble, who we, we should look up to. In fact, look at the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And these people were called the Greens now. The book of Acts chapter 17, look what it says here. I like this. Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 11. It says this. It says, King James, These were more noble than those 
in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. I want to read this to you from the, the NIV, though. It's pretty good. It says this, Now the Berean Jews were of a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Why? For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Did you guys hear that? You see, the people of Thessalonica, they just heard the word, they accepted it, but they never checked it out for themselves. How many times have we gone to church before, heard a sermon, it could have maybe even be a good sermon, but we never went home to check what the preacher was saying. Right. Like I said, you can't trust the preacher, right, Brother Brother? You can only put your trust in God. So even when I'm preaching, write these scriptures down. I remember, man, when I first came into the church, I had to take very good notes. Because I don't know if you guys, I, and I, I told you guys this story. I came into the church um, when Pastor John Loma came. You guys familiar with John Loma came? Was the pastor at Fairfield Church in California. Okay? The way I got into the church was my friend, my high school friend, invited me to church. He invited me to prayer meeting. He said, hey, you got to come, man. you got to hear this guy. He's a good teacher, he's a good preacher, and he's half Filipino. Because I'm Filipino, that's why he tried to get me. And I said, half Filipino? I don't care if he's Filipino. I don't care what he is, right? I said, just let, I, I, I'll, I'll go with you. And I went to church, and when I first seen Pastor John Lomacan, I was about to go right back out the door. Why? Because he was this very tall guy. His head, he reminded me of Count Dracula. I don't know anybody... <laughs> But if, if, you, if you know how it is, right? And then, while he was teaching, he said he's from New York, and he was this and that. I said, oh man, how can I put my trust in this guy? But as those words came out of my, or came in my mind, he said, but don't put your trust in me. He said, put your trust in God. when he said that, I said, I can buy that. I don't trust you, sir, but I can put you trust in God's word. I started going to church and I started taking notes, listening to what this man was saying, but making sure that what he was saying was true. And the Bible says that these Berean Jews, they went to church. They heard Paul preach, and Paul was the, one of the most famous apostles. They heard him preach, but did they take him at his word? No. They received the word with eagerness of mind, but they went home every single day to see if he was say, what he was saying was the truth. And you have to be careful with the preachers that you listen to today. Even on 3 a.m. Yeah, come on now. Let's let me be true, right? No matter what station you're watching, you have to be very careful. Now, I'm not saying that all these preachers are wrong or they're preaching or teaching heresy. But even then, you still have to be careful. Because some teachers, I remember one time I was preaching, and there was a scripture that I kind of took out of context, but not, no, not willingly knowing. And the sister had to take me aside. Hey, brother, did you know this man? I said, okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that. Next time I preach, I won't use that text in that context or that way. Sometimes preachers may not even know, and it's your duty. Don't go to them all, all with an attitude, though. Can I be real? Right? But come to them in love. Yes. And let them know, hey, because they may not even see it themselves. Right? Just come to them in love and study for yourself so that you can show them that they can study themselves also. There's another quotation from that same book, in fact, that same chapter. And it will be a good thing to read this chapter. It's called um, Scripture as, as Our Safeguard. I believe that's what the... Uh, is that what it's called? Scripture as Our Safeguard, right? Look at this. The Great Controversy, page 519. This continues on that quote that we first quoted. It says, There has ever been a class of professing... Uh, ever been a class professing godliness who instead... In fact, they even added some other rules that were even in the Bible. They put their own rules in there. But anyway, look at what it says in John chapter 5, verse 39 and verse 40. Notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says this. It says, search the scriptures. This is Jesus speaking, talking to these Pharisees. Search the scriptures, for in them 
you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Again, let me read it from the NIV version. It makes it a little clear. It says, you study the scriptures. This is Jesus speaking to these Jews, speaking to these religious leaders. He's saying, you study the scriptures diligently. So did the Jews, did they study the Bible? Yes. Did they diligently study the Bible? Yes. But notice what he says. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now let me ask you guys this question. Can we find eternal life studying the Word of God? We, can we find eternal life studying the Word of God? Yes, we can. However, however now, listen to this now. Listen to what Jesus said. These are the very scriptures that testify about who? About me, but yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Yes, you can have eternal life through searching and studying the scriptures, but that eternal life as you're studying, it's going to tell you about Jesus. But these men... Even though they should have known that these scriptures were studying, where we're talking about Jesus, as Jesus was right there before their very eyes, that the Bible was speaking about this Messiah, they looked at Jesus, but they didn't know that the person they were studying about was right in front of their eyes. This Messiah you guys are searching is right here, but instead, you've made the Bible, you've made God's Word. More, uh, this is what they did. They made it more of a works religion. Come on, can I just make it real now? They made it more of a works religion. And can we work our way to heaven? No. Can you work your way to salvation? No. It's a free gift. And you see, Jesus was trying to turn their minds, not upon this works, but upon the work that he was to do on their behalf. And he says, you guys have been studying. You guys have been at this for 10, 15, 30, however many years. 40 years. 40 years. Sister Janet just told her herself. 40 years, right? Been studying this word. But you got it wrong. It's not about, it's about Jesus. Listen to me. The Bible is all about Jesus. Whenever you look at those Old Testament characters, when you look at Moses, we talked about Moses. Guess what? He was a pre, he was a pre uh, a shadow of what Jesus would do for us. When you look at David, when you look at all of these different Bible characters, they were a foreshadow of ultimately what Jesus would do for us. When you look at Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice, that, I, that was pointing right to the cross. The Bible is all about Jesus. Acts chapter two, verse uh, Acts chapter four, verse twelve says, "Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved." And that name is none other than what? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the only name, and why and, and how we can be saved. But did you guys know that there is something even greater? Did the name of Jesus? Oh. You guys are looking at me kind of crazy now, right? After we just read this text. But there's a Bible text that says, says there's something even greater than the name of Jesus. You know, Jesus has many names, right? El Shaddai, they call him Emmanuel, they call him Eternal God, they call him Rose of Sharon, all of these things. But there's something greater than the name. Go to Psalm 138. I want to show you what the Bible says. Okay? Psalm 138. We're going to wind this to a close. Look at Psalm 138 and verse 2. Right? Something greater than the name of Jesus. Psalm 138. Right? Psalm 138, verse 2. You guys there? Amen? Look what the Bible says here. I will worship toward thy holy temple. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou, notice what it says here now, 
Thou has magnified thy what, everyone? Word. Thy word above all thy name. The word of God is even magnified more than the name of Jesus. Why do I say that? Because the name Jesus, you know, back then it was a common name. Even in our day, in the Spanish community, in the Hispanic community, there are many kids named Jesus, except we don't call him Jesus. What do we call him? Jesus. Jesus. Come on now, right? So, little Jesus, I'm sorry, but you're not going to save me. Come on. But there's something greater than the name of Jesus, and that's the Word of God. You see, every name that is pointed to the name of Jesus, Jesus means one who's going to save us. Emmanuel, God is with us. All of those names of God, of Jesus, are characteristics of who he is. It's much more than a name. It's actually the character of what those names symbolize. Are you guys following me? So when we talk about the name of Jesus, his word, that's why we got to get back to the Bible. In fact, one of Jesus' names was the word. John chapter 4, or John chapter 1, turn with me there, John chapter 1. Look what it says here, John 1, verse 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of of men, we all know that according to verse 14, that word is none other than Jesus Christ. And without Jesus, without that word, we would not exist. Without Jesus, we wouldn't even be here today. So when we study God's word, we're studying about Jesus. That's what we're doing. Jesus said himself, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word, is what everyone is truth. We're living in a world where you go on your news page and you hear nothing but what they call it fake news. You guys heard that before, right? Fake news. People are reporting things as though they're real, but really they're fake. Well, I'm tired of fake news. What about you? Come on. I want to hear the I want to hear the good news. Amen. Anybody else, right? And the Bible says that the word is true. The word is true, it's good news. In fact, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, and I'll read these on the screen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How much scripture? You know, there are some people who say, I don't need that Old Testament. Right? Have you heard that before? I've studied with people before. Oh, I don't need that old test. We're, we're in the new dispensation, right? We just study the New Testament. Well, if you look the Old Testament, and the Old Testament outweighs the New Testament, right? And in fact, when the Apostle Paul told this to Timothy, when he said all scriptures given by inspiration of God, there was no New Testament at the time. He was talking about the Old Testament. He said, all scripture, I'm talking about the Old Testament. That's inspired. All scripture. And what does it say? Look at this. I like this diagram here. Because it says, all scripture is given for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Well, what is doctrine? Doctrine is another word for teachings. Okay? So the Bible is there to teach me the right way. Teach me the way I should go. That's what the doctrine's for. Now, the word reproof means showing me where I am wrong and where I am off track. All right? Some of us don't like reproof. But this is what the Bible does. It will show us the right way, but if we're going off track, it will steer us. It will say, hold on, you're going in the wrong direction. That's reproof. You're going the wrong way. But then it also says it corrects. It's for correction. It, even though it reproves us, it shows us, it corrects us on how to get back on track. And then finally, instruction in righteousness, it instructs me as how I can stay on the road of righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Matthew 4, 4, you guys remember the story? After Jesus 
was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. You guys remember that? Satan came to him and he said, hey, you can turn those stones into bread. But this was the response of Jesus. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I would have turned those stones into bread. Jesus was a much more nobler man than I am, right? But he showed us, he quoted, I believe this is the book of Deuteronomy, he said every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that's what we should live by. Job chapter 23, verse 12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my, what kind of food? Necessary food. That's talking about food that you need to live. Job said, I esteem God's word more than my necessary food. If you have a choice in the morning between Wheaties, the breakfast of champions, come on now, versus the Bible, the breakfast of Christians, you better have your word this morning. Amen, right? They said, you have, you have your Wheaties this morning? Even though Wheaties is the breakfast of champions, the word is the breakfast of Christians. You got to eat that. Oatmeal, yeah, that's that good stuff, right? Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You see, when we eat God's word, it sure tastes good, doesn't it? It should bring a joy to your heart that you should rejoice. I know, as for me, when I was working in Sacramento, there were two vegetarian spots out there. One was called Happy Gourmet, and the other one was called New China. Right? This Chinese food. Vegetarian spots, man. When I heard about these places, I said, you know, when I was going to Amazing Facts, the school there, a lot of the people who were going to school were vegetarian. They said, we got to check this place out. We went to Happy Gourmet first. They had one, they had two menus. One was regular meat, then they had a whole menu on vegetarian. But you know, I've had vegetarian food that mm, wasn't too good. Anybody else in here, right? You know, people try to try that potluck and like, you should have tried it at home before you go out to church, right? <laughs> should have tried it with your husband first or whatever. But I remember when we got done, we were like, oh my goodness, we got to go tell brother so-and-so, we got to go tell us and we are telling people, this is the spot. And then we tried the other spot. We called that, what did we call it? Uh, I, don't know, I can't forget what we gave. We gave these restaurants nicknames. Then we went to New China. And they had, they had this Mongolian beef. It wasn't beef, y'all, all right? And they had um, this lemon chicken. And what I would do, too, is sometimes I would invite my non-vegetarian friends and don't tell them that it's vegetarian. And they'll be like, I thought you don't eat meat. And I'm eating the meat with them, you know. I thought you didn't eat meat. I said, I, well, today, man, it's a, it's a special occasion. You're with me. And then afterwards, I come and tell the waitress and, to let him know that it was all vegetarian. I said that to say this. When you know of a good restaurant, that it's good, you can't help but tell others that they got to try it. That's right. Oh, you guys ain't feeling me today. <laughs> When you go to a restaurant, now there's not many, in Elko, there's no good, all right, I'm just going to tell you, all right? I don't know about Wyndham Oakley, I'm going to have to show you the spots, okay? China House. China House, okay. All right, we're going to try that next time. But, then, but when you know of a good spot to eat, you want to go run and tell somebody about that spot. You want to invite them, you'll even pay for the meal, right? But next time, they got to pay, right? But you gotta, you'll even pay for the meal. When we get a taste, of the joy that the Word of God can bring when we taste and see that the Word is good, it should be a natural response to go and tell others that we found some food that was good for their soul. You see, there's going to be one day, I want to go to this last text, turn with me, Amos chapter 8. And the reason why I'm preaching this sermon, the reason why I'm telling you this, is that we need to get back to the Bible. It's because of this verse right here in the book of Amos. Right? Go to Amos chapter 8. Amos.
books of the Lamb, hard books to find in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 8, after the book of Joel, for those who are looking, Hosea, Joel, Amos. He went to Jonah and Micah, he went too far. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. The reason why I'm preaching this, I need to get back to the Bible, is because of this verse. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and verse 12. Notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says here, Behold, are you guys there, amen? amen? Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a what? A famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. There's going to be a time where I believe it's going to be just like the dark ages. Remember when the Bible was hidden from the people? You see, now it's the opposite. We have access to the Bible anywhere in our smartphones, this and that. But soon and very soon, I believe that they may take these things away. There's going to be a famine in the land. People then are going to be searching for the word of God, but they can't find it. The only way you'll have that word is if you hide it in your heart. Are you guys listening to me? The Bible says, I've hid thy word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Now that we have the capability, now that we have the access to the word of God, let's put that word of God in our heart. Because there's going to be a time, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, just like what the Bible said. Well, there's going to be a famine. Not of bread, not of water, but of the word of God. People are going to be going to and fro looking for this word. But unless it's in here, and unless it's in here, it won't be in to find it. Quotation, the last one, Evangelism 456, a revival in Bible study. Is needed throughout where? Oh, no, no, no. You gotta make it personal. Throughout where? <laughs> With a mother? No, even more personal, right? In us, that's right. In our homes, ourselves. Attention is to be called not to the assertions of men. You see, too many times we put our, our trust and we put, you know, everything. Don't, don't depend on me, y'all. This is a church. This is a family. Right? Don't put your assertions to men. That's where people get messed up. But put your assertion to the word of God. As this is done, notice this now, a mighty work will be wrought. When God declared that his word should not return unto him void, he meant all that he said. The gospel is to be preached to all nations. The, pe the Bible is to be open to the people. A knowledge of God is the highest education, and it will cover the earth with its wonderful truth as the waters cover the sea. My prayer for us is that we have a revival of prayer and Bible study in our homes. What about you? Is that something that you want to Close with this story. About a young lady who was attending a college university as she was attending the university, she was taking certain classes, and there was this English class that she was taking. And just like what I was saying before, she had to do a report on this particular book. Now, she got the book, and the first day she got the book, she went home. She attempted to read the book, but it was a snoozer. Any of you guys read, try to read a book, and it was just a snooze fest? As soon as you try to read the first page, you were out, right? You would, you, you would, instead of taking medicine, you would read that first page just so that you could go to sleep, right? And she fell asleep. She said, it's boring, it's dull, it's not interesting. And she said, I'll just wait later on and to do my report. Well, as the year went by, she met up with this young college professor. And they actually developed a relationship, and they fell in love with each other. So much to a point where one day they were on a picnic, had the blanket there, they had the basket, they had the food. She brought her book bag just in case she could slip in some reading because that report was due soon. 
And they were having a good time, and as she was taking some out of her book bag, the young professor noticed the book. Grabbed the book, and he was flipping through the pages, and he said to her, hey, do you like this book? How, well, how do you feel about this book? And she said, man, to be honest with you, it is boring, it's dull, it's uninteresting. I tried to read the first page, I couldn't even get through. He said, is that right? Handed her back the book, and then she looked at the book very carefully, and she started to chuckle, she started to laugh, and the young professor was like, why are you laughing? It's so funny. He said, well, did you know that you have the same name as the author of this book? <laughs> he looked at her and said, well, it's not funny because I am the author of that book. And she was so embarrassed. She went home that night. Guess what she did? She read that book. She read the first page, the second page, from cover to cover. She read that entire book that night. And at the end of reading that book, she exclaimed, this is the best book that I've ever read. Come on now. What changed her perspective? She had a relationship. And love to the author. You see, oftentimes, we may think that this book is boring, dull, uninteresting. But that's because we haven't developed that relationship with the author. And when you fall in love with Jesus, when you develop that relationship through prayer, the more and more you study, the more and more you will find out that this book will be the best book that you have. This book will be the best book that you've ever read. So brothers and sisters, we need to get back to the Bible. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to make an appeal, a simple appeal today. And I want to pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful words of life that show us more about Jesus, that show us who Jesus is that will help us to live a truly Christian and productive life for Christ. Lord, in this room, I don't know, maybe not anyone, but you have told me, you have encouraged me to preach this sermon that maybe someone in here needs to get back to the study of God's Word. Maybe someone in here is struggling with studying, struggling with prayer, struggling with doing what they know to do develop their relationship, cultivate their relationship with Jesus. Well, today I'm going to give you an opportunity to say, Lord, first off, I'm sorry. I repent. I apologize for not doing my part. I apologize for not studying, not seeking you in prayer. And today, I want to dedicate, I want to consecrate my life to spending time each day Devote time each day to pray and to study. And I'm going to give you that opportunity. If that's your desire, if you want to dedicate, devote, consecrate your time, starting today, to spend some time in prayer and the study of God's Word, just raise your hand right where you are. This this Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord, you see the hands that went up. Lord, we ask that you seal this decision. Because as you said through the spirit of prophecy, Satan well knows that all who he can lead to neglect the prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. But those who raise their hand, they declare they don't want to be overcome. But we want to be overcomers. And Lord, you said we can overcome through Christ Jesus our Lord. The way we do that is to study your word. So Lord, I thank you for those who made a decision today to get back to the Bible. Now please seal these decisions. Help us to be faithful to you until the end. This is my prayer, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.